I may fall asleep, so I probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> the let me at first uh, introduce uh, the special guest of this evening in uh, the American Academy, Sonia Sotomayor. Mm -hmm. uh, you all have heard already uh, much of her childhood, but um, I would <laughs> inform you that her parents came from Puerto Rico and uh, as you already told, they lived uh, 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 together in the South Bronx and you visited the Catholic Church, a Catholic Church. Um, one moment, uh, I will see that I don't forget. Uh, her childhood was as you already told, very precarious. Not only, but I think above all, because you suffered from juvenile diabetes. And you will later on, uh, I think, uh, speak about this. As beneficiary of the affirmative action, she uh, studied in Princeton and later in Yale University, uh, Yale Law School, and left these both institutions with outstanding examinations. And after her study, she began her, she started her professional career as assistant attorney, uh, you would say, as assistant prosecutor in criminal cases. And in order to complete her civil law knowledge, she worked in a little law firm. It was a little law firm, but an extraordinary law firm. Uh, I think you should tell something about it. And if you look at this book, if you already told what her career as a judge was, from 1992 to 1998, she served as a judge in the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York, and from 1998 to 2009 on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And in May, President Obama nominated you as Assistant Justice to the US Supreme Court, and you assumed this role, I think, in August 2009. If you hear this, uh, you must have the impression that this is a chain of happy circumstances. But if you read the book I have read, then you got another expression. It was very difficult to make such a career up to the Supreme Court. And uh, she described very concretely and impressively what it means or what it meant to her to think like a judge or to think like a lawyer or to think like a prosecutor. And uh, I see my task to make her speak. And I will arise questions, and she, uh, she will give the answer, and I think I have two passages which you should read personally. But let me at first ask, why did you read in such young years this book? There are a lot of reasons. I think anybody who writes a book for just one purpose is not giving readers a depth of knowledge or experience. I think you have to have a lot of reasons to write a book. The first reason, and I'm, they're all work together, so it's not the first among, it's not the first among equals, but they each worked in tandem. As I was experiencing being a justice my first year on the bench, I realized that my world had changed completely. I had been ripped from my life in New York, 
from my family and friends, from a city that I adored and exploited in every way. I have a friend who said that he knew no one who uh, used every opportunity that New York City gave them the way I did. And it's true, I loved my life. And all of a sudden, a rocket ship took me to that other world yet again, Washington, DC. But it catapulted me into a life of fame, not just domestically, but internationally. And with fame comes certain losses, a loss of privacy, a loss of the ability to speak without being guarded, the loss of being able to make friends without suspicion of their motives, especially if you live in a political city like Washington, D.C., where the currency, regrettably, is often what you can do for people. And there's a lot of prestige in knowing a justice. And so the ways of my living were changing. And then on top of it, add the deference that people in the court pay to justices. They are respectful even when they shouldn't be. Because we behave badly sometimes, OK? Yet people forgive us even when they shouldn't. I had a child once visit me who wrote me a letter afterwards and said, I want to become a judge like you. I want to have a job for life. She was in my office when my staff was eating pizza, and she said, I can eat pizza every day. <laughs> and people will laugh at your jokes even when they're not funny. <laughs> well, add that to being a Supreme Court justice, and they, don't, they even laugh at jokes that are not jokes. So, you know, um, my point is that kind of power I know has the possibility of changing you and not changing you for the better. It can make you a bit conceited, a little forgetful about the people around you who are helping you, and a bit self-centered. And I could see all of those forces around me and I needed to find a way to center myself back in me, to make sure that in this new journey that I'm on, this new life that I'm embarking on, that I held on to what I thought was the good in me. And the only way to do that was to stop myself in this process and reflect on my life and on what it is that had gotten me to where I went. And all of the people who have paid a part in that journey. Because not a one of them do I ever want to forget. Um, and so it was important at that point, after my first year, to have that memory alive and to make it unforgettable. And a book would accomplish that. I often tell my friends, I made the book very thick, this thick, so that if I ever got out of place, they'd hit me over the head with me <laughs> and tell me to go back and read it, OK? And I mean it. But that was really one of the forces that was driving me to write the book. The second was that my family was aging. And I knew that I was going to be losing a lot of my older relatives very soon. And in fact, a month after I interviewed my oldest uncle, he died. And it's an amazing joy to me that I have a tape with all his stories. And I use many of them in the book, but as with all books, there's a lot on the cutting room floor. 
Um, and so that I have the tape as a reminder is a wonderful gift. My mother's memory is failing a little bit, and I knew I didn't have much time to capture her memory. And so with that, I knew that if I waited, that I might not have the ability to recreate my background. And third, it was very clear to me that first year on the bench and from the public reaction that my nomination generated, that there were so many people who expressed hope for themselves because of me. Hope about their own futures, about their own abilities, about what they might be able to do. And I realized that from questions children were asking me in the various audiences, and even adults, not even children, but adults as well, who were facing challenges, that I could offer them some consolation. So I had a child who must have been in, I think it was seventh grade, who said to me, how did you deal with losing your father? This is before my book. And I knew from the way the child asked the question that the child had just lost a parent. So I talked to them about the emotional cost to the family and how hard it is and how difficult it is to forget the pain and live with the good memories. And, and I then afterwards, and when everybody else was leaving, I took the child apart and I gave them a hug and explained that it was really hurtful, but they would manage to come out of it a better person because of the memories that they had. At any rate, I understood from that moment and others similar to it that I had a story that could give people some hope, but that the only way to do it was to make sure people understood one truth. I'm just like them. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Please let us uh, speak. Uh, you are all know with people my beloved world. This is no political analysis. This is a biography. And uh, I think we should speak uh, over the, about the biography. Please tell us at first what made you so strong. <laughs> Adversity. You know, I say in the book, some people with adversity get knocked down and never get up. But I'm stubborn. In the book, I, you know, I write it more in a more literary style, and I talk about it as perseverance, perseverance and determination. Well, the reality, those are nice words for just being downright stubborn. My mother tells the story that when I was a, ch a toddler and she was trying to feed me, when I had too much, I would bunch up my lips so that she couldn't put the spoon in my mouth. And she would do like this and force it in. And at a certain point, um, I would never give up, and she'd have to do it until I finished the food. Now she feels guilty because I fight weight all the time. And I tell her it's her fault for force food. <laughs> that one, and she knows, we still joke about it. Um, but my point is that it is stubbornness. It's the desire, even when I was losing in a fight, I would get back up and keep going into the fight. I can't tell you how many times my brother got into trouble and I went to fight bigger boys than me. And they would knock me down. And, most, and they'd have to walk away because they knew they were going to hurt me. Um, but I think you need a certain amount of stubbornness in life to persist. You need to want not to give in because that's what makes you try. And that's what makes, motivates you to continue even in the face of high resistance and high odds. Um, I think every successful person has that perseverance that drive that says, 
you won't beat me. Even when you're being beaten. Mm -hmm. Because everybody fails at something. And I describe my failures in the book. But if you can take lessons from failure and learn how to use them in a positive way, then in the end, you've been the winner. And that's what I've tried to do with all of my failures, try to figure out what lessons it taught me. Um, I spoke without valuation about your precarious childhood. Uh, and I think there was one uh, event which made you so strong. It is a very good example. Uh, would you uh, speak about your juvenile diabetes and the first uh, disposal you had with your parents? Um, I was uh, seven and a half when I began to um, urinate in bed at night when I was asleep. And it's strange because I had been toilet trained very young. I began to drink water, I drink not then water, juice, anything in excess. These are classic signs of diabetes. Um, but the last sign was at the time um, the Catholic Church did not let you eat in the morning before you took communion. And in one of those Sunday mornings, I blacked out in church. And the nuns made my mother the nurse take me to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I think as with many parents, they don't want to believe something's wrong. And my mother didn't want to believe that something was wrong. I still remember the diagnosis. And for the first time ever, uh, it was a very, very small hospital. And there was a waiting room literally steps away from the elevator. And there was a reception over on the left. And around that corner was the doctor's office. And I sat at the very front and looked back watching my mother through the doorway. And I heard the doctor talking, and I saw my mother crying. And at that moment, I knew something was seriously wrong. Because that's the first time I had seen my mother cry. The problem is that back then, I think people are a little better about it today. But back then, disease was something that people were scared of. And not only were they scared of it, they thought children didn't understand or couldn't understand. So people try to hide things. And the, the first thing the doctor said to me was, you've got a condition, but it's not so bad. Um, you just have to change what you're going to eat and drink. You're going to have to drink, I have it, and you're going to have to drink soda without sugar. And I drink it all the time, and he had some bottles of it behind him, and he pulled one up, and he opened it up, and he said, drink it, it's really, really good. I drank it, and it was really, really bad. <laughs> um, and back then, skin milk, because the milk has a lot of sugar, looked gray. It really was ugly and gray. And the first time my mother put it in my cereal, I realized, oh boy, this is going to be bad. But their fear, even though they were hiding it, you couldn't hide their fear. And when they thought I wasn't listening, I heard them talking about the fact that I could die, that it was a curse that had come from my mother's side. Um, I heard them talking, and I knew that this was something to be frightened about. But I didn't know what I was going to be frightened about. And at any rate, um, an experience for a child in a hospital can be nerve-wracking. I felt like a guinea pig. They would come in every hour and take blood out of my arm. Every half hour, they would take a little scalpel and cut a, my finger to draw blood. 
Um, and they did this for hours. And they took me into a big room with a bunch of doctors staring at me. And I remember looking at them and thinking to myself, I am, what am I? They're talking about me, but they're not talking to me. And all of it was just so overwhelmingly frightening to me and to my mother and my father. And that disease in so many ways marked my growing up. You're right, it was a pivotal moment in my life. And my choice, as soon as we got home, to, give, to learn how to give myself injections at seven and a half was born from my need, my understanding that if I didn't learn how to do that, I couldn't stay over with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Because I knew she could never give me that shot. As much as she loved me, I knew that it would tear her apart if, she, if I asked her to give me my insulin. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is I couldn't stay with her and I would have to live in my then unhappy home. And it was almost an instantaneous moment as I was watching my mother and father arguing about who was gonna give me my shot, that I thought about my grandmother and I said, mm, gotta do this myself. And I stepped up and did it and it worked. I hurt myself less than they hurt me. And I, then started. My mother will tell you that in my 50 odd years of diabetes, she's only given me a shot once. Mm -hmm. And it's when I was sick and I couldn't give it to myself in my arms and she had to reach behind to give it to me. Same here. And that's the only time. But um, yes, it, it, diabetes made me more disciplined. I learned how to take care of myself. It made me more independent. And so even with a bad disease, you can learn some positive lessons. Thank you. Uh, you told that your mother was more tough than tender, uh, at least in your early years. But nevertheless, one has the impression that she made a great contribution to your education and uh, development. If you would say something about this. I was asked at the dinner table what my favorite part of my book was, so I'll repeat it to the whole audience. It's chapter seven. I'm assuming the German chapters are the same, right? Yeah. Jennifer, where are you? <laughs> chapter seven is the chapter of my mother's life. And when you read it, I learned many things about my mother researching this book. And I learned about the love affair that my mother and father had had. By the time I had consciousness about life around me, my father had, his drinking had turned into alcoholism. And the alcoholism had led to many, many fights between my parents and to an unhappy home. But with it, it provoked the worst in my mother. Um, and a product of her lack of love in her own life because she didn't have an example of love. She had been orphaned at the age of nine. She had been raised by a tough sister. And she literally ran away from home at 17 and joined the wax. Um, it, there's a funny story in the book you should read. Um, they asked her for a birth certificate, but you had to be 18. And so she went back and told her brother and her sister that they would put them in jail for letting her apply to the army when she wasn't 18 yet. So they better find proof that she was 18. <laughs> My uncle was at the time rising in his influence in his town and found someone to give her an affidavit that she was 18. Um, at any rate, and so she joined the wax and came to the United States, and she and my father met here. But my mother didn't have an example of tenderness. She only had an example of tough love. And so she had nothing to model but what she had grown up with. And that's how she raised us in my early years. 
over time that changed, and that's part of my story of how parents and children can grow together. Um, I talk about my own success and my own growth, and I say in the book that mo my mother has taken every step with me. Her willingness to grow with me and not against me has been the greatest salvation of my life. But the one thing my mother believed in was education. My mom loved books. And she'll tell you she didn't do well in school because every minute that she could steal, she spent in the library reading books. And when I was growing up, I had an example of a mother and a father who read. My father read the newspaper. Regrettably, by the time the evening came, he had drunk too much to read, but I knew he read the paper every day. My mother not only read the paper, but she had the Reader's Digest in the house. She had books in the house. She would buy magazines for us to read as children. I think I was the only child who had the highlight magazine for the Americans in the room. They know that's a magazine for children that was only in doctor's offices. <laughs> but my mother thought that it would teach us something, and so she ordered it for the house. And I tell the story in the book of her buying the encyclopedia <laughs> and making weekly payments so that we could learn. And in fact, those books were marvelous. We didn't have computers back then, remember, guys. And uh, libraries were there, but they were a big distance from where I was as a child. Even as an adult, it was a subway ride away. Actually, two subway rides away. Um, and so having that encyclopedia was a window into worlds that I knew nothing about. And I would often find myself at her bookshelf, just sitting at the bottom of the bookshelf, reading another chapter about something. And it was a wonderful learning experience as a child. And then when I was in high school, my mother went to college. It was her dream to graduate from college. And when I often tell people, my, I was just going into college. My brother was behind me a, couple, a few years. He was about to go in a few years. It's very hard not to know the value of education when you see your parent at the table studying with you. And so the value of education was the greatest gift my mother could have given me and my brother. I became a lawyer. My brother became a doctor. Um, we have both been successful because of our education. And because of the opportunities that that education has given to us. And so I tell that to every parent I meet. That's the one lesson of parenthood I would pass to every parent. If you want your child to read, you have to read in front of them. You have to set the example. Yes. You're right. Uh, th th you told about the condition of your educational development, uh, but there were other uh, factors of influence, and uh, you should. Uh, what did you um, differ from other women? It is. Uh, we all know that uh, in your country and in our country, uh, nearly fifty percent of the law students are female students. Uh, nevertheless, you will find in your country and even more in my country, not so many female uh, aspirants in high positions. What was the difference between you and other uh, female students uh, in Princeton or in Yale? Why don't you give me the conversation with Rudy? And that conversation, I think, we talked about the passages she wanted me to read. Yes. Um, I think that that passage explains it all. 
Einen Moment, ich habe gleich die Stelle und dann darf ich, das, ich sage es mal schnell deutsch, das Buch, das ich noch hier in deutscher Sprache habe, durch die Reihen geben, weil da wunderhübsche Bilder sind. Pictures of her and her relatives and uh, you will find uh, explanations, who is it? And, uh, may I start with you? Despite the fact that you all... You oh. will find in the pictures a picture of some handwriting that I found in my research for the book behind a picture of my brother and I when he was one year old and I was almost three. And it was a note by my father on my brother's first birthday. And it's the first time I had seen my father's handwriting. And what he said was immensely touching. And that was a dis another discovery of the book. Okay. All right. One day, we were having a perfectly civil exchange when out of the blue, Rudy, he was a law school friend of mine, interrupted me. You know what I love about you, Sonia? You argue just like a guy. Kevin, who was my husband, stretched out on the couch, snorted a gulp full of his soda, choking down a laugh. What is that supposed to mean, I said to Rudy. Suddenly, I was seething, and they knew it. Felix asserted his calming influence. It's a good thing, Sonia. He means it as a compliment. I had heard compliments like that before. <laughs> Rudy forged on, explaining, I didn't hedge every statement with disclaimers, apologies, and self-doubt. He did his impression of how women raised their hands in class. Excuse me, professor, I'm sorry. This may not be important, but you may want to consider the possibility. <laughs> not you, Sonia. He said, when you, ask to be, when, you, when you ask to be called on, you just state your case plain and defy anyone to prove you wrong. Well, Rudy was right in this sense. I have always argued like a man, more noticeably in the context of those days, when an apologetic and tentative manner of speech was the norm among women. I don't know where I learned this style, but it has served me well, especially in the years when most of the people I was arguing with were men. I don't know where I got it. I, um, but I know that it's what caused people to say that I was argumentative, tough, Some called me the B word in mm. English. Um, simply, I was aggressive. Mm. They didn't use adjectives like assertive, confident, any of the words that they usually use to describe strong men. <coughs> strong women, they use negative terms about. And it is a societal condition. Mm. You know, tough men are demanding. But tough women are trying to emasculate you. Mm. Um, that's a big difference in how women come out of the process of success. And they, how they navigate a world where most decision makers are men. And I tell young women now, Not every woman has to argue like a man, and I wouldn't even encourage them to want to try. It's not necessarily good, and it's certainly not good in every context. But no style is good in every context. One of the things that you have to do with any style that's your, your own is to use it to good effect. And by that I mean use it when it's valuable, and change your style when you need to. And so very aggressive Sonia can be very calm and gentle when I need to be. 
Um, I can be soft when I need to be. Mm. But there are moments where to survive, you have to know how to be tough. And that difference, I think, is one that we have to teach more young girls. And in t learning how to be conciliatory as people, I think that that's a good trait. We could teach it to our sons more, too. Um, but I think we have to teach both the value of strength when it's necessary. Please uh, let us know uh, what are your experiences uh, with affirmative action. When I studied law, when I was a young professor, we always thought that affirmative action is a, a wonderful instrument. Uh, but how uh, did it touch your life? I say a line in my book, um, which is really my view of its effect. Affirmative action brought students, people like me, to the beginning of a race that we didn't even know was being run. When you read my book, you will learn that I didn't even know what an Ivy League school was. Mm -hmm. I certainly, as I think someone said earlier, Bill was at you, I didn't know when I got it what summa cum laude was. The professor t look, told me, I looked and said, because he expected to me to say it was wonderful. I said, that's great. And I went home to the dictionary that sat by my bed and I looked it up and I said, oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I, if you come from the world I do, where no one in your world knows anything further than the life they're leading, the struggles they're having to survive from day to day, how do you prepare yourself for a, an education you know nothing about? Sometimes by luck, as I had it, you can go to a high school that prepared me enough so that I could survive and do well in Princeton. But except for a friend who told me to apply to Princeton, no guidance counselor, no teacher, no one talked about Ivy League schools in my high school at the time, I wouldn't have known the race was starting. And so I was lucky because affirmative action made a place like Princeton open enough to explore finding minority students in schools they knew nothing about. And that's why they came to my Catholic high school. And after my friend who was at Princeton first succeeded, and then I succeeded, my high school today has almost a 99% college bound program. And it has many students going into the Ivy Leagues, into the sister schools, going to some of the finest colleges. But those were a product of places like Princeton and Harvard and Yale not going only to private schools to seek out their well-trained students, but to try to find students who showed promise in the things that they had accomplished and gave them an opportunity to show them their strengths. I tell kids all the time, yes, affirmative action may have gotten you in the door, but it can't and shouldn't be your measure of success. Your personal measure of success is what you do with that opportunity you were given. Mm -hmm. If you waste it, by performing poorly and not trying, then you're valueless. Not to the school, but to yourself and to our community. You have an obligation to take that opportunity to its fullest and use every resource that you're given to learn how to be a better person, to learn how to be a better student, to accomplish as much as you can accomplish and do as much as you can do. And then hopefully la later, there's an American term, I don't know if you're using it in Germany yet, pay it forward. You can't say thank you to the people who helped you, 
They usually don't need your thank you because they've been successful. So what you do is you be good to somebody mm -hmm. who's younger than you. So you pay it forward. But that is what affirmative action meant to me personally. And the number of successful minorities, the people who are no longer living in the kind of poverty that my parents had, there isn't a minority that I know from places like Princeton and Yale who has not done a significant amount with their lives and better their own lives and the lives of their communities by the work they're doing. Um, that's a testament to a part of its success. There are difficulties with it, and it has always been a difficult issue for society. People don't like preferences. They don't like giving special advantage. And I understand why because it's hard sometimes to accept that if you're you and you've worked hard and someone else may or may not have worked as hard as you by your own perceptions and they're getting a favoritism, that feels like discrimination. It feels like a sort of reverse discrimination against you and not for another person. But the reality is Life discriminates. Life discriminates because only certain people are privileged to have good educations. Life discriminates because people can't help that their parents don't speak English. And so their ability to master things has to be earned and fought for on a, greatest be on a, be on a greater scale. Life discriminates because it is true that socioeconomically, black people, American Indians, uh, Latino people, earn a fraction of the salaries that other communities do. That our kids are dropping out of subpar schools because most of the education in the United States is supported by property taxes. And if you live in a rich neighborhood, um, your school is going to be better because they have more money. If you live in a poor neighborhood, your schools are going to be poor. So life discriminates. But I do think that a society that accepts that diversity in life means diversity in all things. Life experience, background, professional experience that all of those enrich the society. They bring something new and something novel to the environment. And they teach. If you accept that that's the purpose of diversity, not just in a university, but in life, then it's a richness that you have to accept will create differences. Let us speak once more about the conditions of your success. Because I think that a very important factor isn't mentioned till now. Okay. And um, you, say, you showed us that your family, especially your mother, uh, and uh, your stubbornness uh, was uh, a great factor in uh, your success, but uh, you uh, mentioned another fact uh, and uh, described uh, very concretely and impressively uh, here in this book. On, and uh, because it is uh, a special finding in uh, the German sociology, that it is the same way to make a successful career in an uh, official service. Uh, do you know what I mean? No. no. <laughs> then, then I would say to uh, your community service, ah, your pro bono. Okay. Well, I, that's why I'm a lawyer. Um, people think that lawyers, that their job is to make money. Um, and it helps because you have to support yourself. In any occupation, you have to find enough income to support yourself and your family. 
But I always saw the reason for law as being an opportunity to help people have better relations. You are serving people and institutions by helping them either avoid problems, contract negotiation, um, business structuring. All of those things are to order the relationship between people and institutions and companies in ways in which their interest can be accommodated and worked into a form that will avoid trouble. And when they get into trouble, mm -hmm. they hire another set of lawyers or different lawyers to try to resolve those problems, hopefully in a way that does the least damage to everyone. Now, as anyone who's been involved in a lawsuit knows, lawyers often don't lose in a lawsuit. They get paid. But parties often lose in a lawsuit because even when they win, they have to pay their lawyers. If more people understood that, they would let lawyers actually work more settlements earlier in their disputes. Because I think that a good lawyer is a lawyer who recognizes not only his or her client's needs, but understands the needs of the other side and makes proposals that it can accommodate both sides, that can save face for both sides, that can give where it's important and take where it does the least damage to either side. That's what I always thought my job as a lawyer was, to help people's relationships. And to the extent that I believe that, then the law was the profession that I wanted to do. And it was a profession that I wanted to do in a way in service to others, to help them in their lives with the relationships that the law couldn't. And so my community service, for example, um, some of it was in law. I was a member of a civil rights group that did litigation. But I was also a member of a mortgage agency that gave low interest loans to uh, low income families so that they could afford to buy their homes instead of always renting them. My program was successful. It wasn't part of the 2009 <laughs> debacle. Um, I also was on the campaign finance board for New York that gave out public money for campaigning to try to avoid um, the uh, rise of, of election payments by private parties. And for a time, it worked in New York. It worked until the Supreme Court stepped in. Um, <laughs> I'm only laughing because I was in the dissent on um, two of those issues. So um, my point is that I, I described today at an earlier talk with someone that I tell people that you should ask yourself two questions every night before you go to sleep. Because if you ask yourself these two questions and you can give an answer, then you've had a meaningful day. And the question, two questions are, what did you learn today and that was new? And what act of kindness and giving did you do today? If you can answer those questions, then you've been a meaningful person. And I truly believe that. I believe that every person, whether they're a lawyer or whatever profession that they're in, that they have an obligation to serve, to be a citizen of the community they're in. And I, by citizenship, I don't mean legal citizenship. I mean participating citizenship, taking control of your community and bettering it 
for others and in the process bettering it for yourself. So to me, the call to public service has been a guiding light, probably since, I would say since college. Wonderful. Um, we have uh, such findings. Uh, our federal minister of justice asked why some uh, or, or few women are very successful. And he gave the same answer as you gave, because they worked in pro bono works, in pro bono ex uh, engagement, uh, what we call ehrenamtliche Tätigkeit. Uh, I, it was very difficult to find the expression in English, but you used uh, community service and pro bono engagement. And, uh, well, you see, is. I think that people mistake that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that you have to have an occupation that's pro bono. I went to a private law firm, mm -hmm. and I tell young minority lawyers, our community needs people who are making money. We need money to build things. We need money to fund new businesses. We need money to give expression to new ideas. Um, people who are poor don't need you to be poor. Mm -hmm. They need for you, we need to build up our middle class. This is a very capitalistic idea. We need to build up our middle class so that we are funding our own needs. And I do think that more women, more minorities, have to understand that that need is as great as the pro bono work is. Mm -hmm. And that we need for them to make choices a little bit more like I did for a period, which was to go into a private enterprises and do their pro bono work without pay. Mm -hmm. um, because I think everybody has an obligation to serve but it doesn't have to be tied up to your salary all mm -hmm. the time. No, no. Uh, I read a sentence in your book, and I will cite it, and uh, you will explain it to us. You said, virtue in obscurity is rewarded only in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, virtue in obscurity is rewarded only in heaven. It was um, a statement to women who tend to labor without recognition. It was in that context that I was talking. Um, the virtue of doing things quietly is important. But it is also important sometimes to uh, make noise about what you're doing, to get other people to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, yes, God will reward you. But sometimes you need for that attention to help others as well, here and now. What is your native, your mother language? My mother language is Spanish. Spanish. And you can also speak, as we all see, uh, English. You are bilingual. <laughs> uh, yes. What, uh, which advantage it meant to me? Perfect in two languages. You see in my book that I, the beginning of the book has an epitaph in, of a Spanish poem. And it's an epitaph that comes from a poem by a famous Spanish author. Um, and I stole his phrase, my beloved world. But I've given attribution, so it wasn't quite plagiarism, okay? Um, and my book is filled with poetry that my grandmother talked when I was a child. Not really talked, performed when I was a child. The only way that you can really learn another culture, appreciate its nuances, share in its beauty, grieve in its disappointments, live like another person lives, is through their language. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I know English and have grown up in the sort of schizophrenic American culture, schizophrenic because we have a piece of everything in American, in American 
culture. You know, mm. we have German hot dogs and Jewish hot dogs. We have um, um, we have Chinese Latin food. I don't think they have that in China. Um, <laughs> we are a, 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 a the American culture is sort of a mixed pot of many different things. It is my beauty of knowing the English language that has led me to understand it so fundamentally. But it's my ability to speak and read and understand Spanish that has given me the Latina soul, that has given me the beauty of the culture I come from. It's artistic beauty, it's heritage, it's traditions, it's sense of family, which is not different than the American sense of family, but different in some ways. Um, we have more extended families than I think Americans tend to, um, where the extended families are really support, not emotional support networks, but financial support networks. Um, and that makes a big difference in our survival. Uh, all of those things, I think, have made me first a more interesting person, but second a more curious person. Because in looking at life through a different set of eyes, I grow. And in growing, I can give more because I understand more. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the value of anyone learning more than one language. You will expand your views you will see the world in a slightly different way. And I think that has value for finding solutions to world problems. I think it has values to finding better answers to the issues that vex us all, whether they're economic, health, or other issues. That's the value to me. Thank you. Uh, in the Goethe Institute, we tried uh, to teach this. Inside, <laughs> but what's very difficult. Uh, All right, now, um, who was taking photographs? Is, has he disappeared? Come on back. <laughs> this is how I get people to ask questions. <laughs> Do you mind if I get up and walk around? I'm tired of sitting still. You, you read in my book that when I was a child, they called me an ahi, which means hot pepper because I was always moving around. I've become an adult, and I don't like sitting still too long either. So I'm getting up. How I get you to ask questions is that every person who I pick on, who raises their hand, gets a private picture with me. <laughs> I'm not above bribery. I have, I have paid one godson a dollar for every book he read. So. Who's going to be brave and ask the first question? All right, come. She beat you to it. <laughs> come on out. And let me, you, the camera guy can tell me when I'm out of range, OK? <laughs> Hello. Tell Hello. me your name. My name is Nora. Hello, Nora. Hold on. We're. <laughs> You'll find it works. <laughs> well, I, I would have asked this question anyway, but it's a privilege. Thank you. Um, I read in your book that you write a lot about uh, the women in your family and how important they were in forming you as a person. Um, and I just came back from a wonderful feminist lawyers conference, which was an all women's conference, from students to the most accomplished uh, justices and uh, professors. And uh, I was wondering, I, I think that in your book you write a lot about men who promoted you, and you write a lot about also the difficulties of being accepted as an equal among men in your profession. And I wonder how important um, female solidarity in, my, in your professional life is for you. Do you draw on women's solidarity? You know, I talk in my book about um, some of the things that I think minorities do right and some of the things that I think we should consider doing differently. There is no question that I drew a lot of support from people with my background when I was in college and law school. 
um, when you're entering something that is completely different and alien to you, you often need to reach out to people who share your insecurities, who share your background, so that you know how to survive in this alien world. But it's equally important, and I think that many forget this, that you're there in a new environment, not to build walls between you and others, but to use the comfort to break down the walls and learn about the other world in a safe way. And so I talk about not building bridge walls, but building bridges. And I think that that's true whether it's students or people in professions. You can draw and should draw emotional strength for the, from the women professionals in your life. To the extent that there are some who can mentor you and help you grow and learn, you should certainly seek them out. But that shouldn't be to the exclusion of understanding that males are OK. <laughs> All right, guys, you know. Um, <laughs> no, and, and many of them have much to give and to teach. Like everyone else, you can draw um, values and, and examples from anybody, regardless of the sex, regardless of the ethnicity, regardless of their backgrounds. I tell people to go into environments and look at someone who's successful and who does things in a way you don't do. And those are the people you target as mentors. Because if you pick a mentor who's just like you, you're not going to learn very much new. You have to pick someone who you admire and who is doing something you can't do. And then you have to work with them to figure out how you can do it. And so I, I do think you use the word solidarity. I mean, I talk in my book, um, and, and I said this joke the other day in a different context. I don't think that there's a male friend that I would have gone into a dressing room with and let him tell me that who bought my underwear, my mother, and that I would have said yes to, OK? You have to read my book for that story, guys, OK? There are some things you can only do with another woman, all right? And that was one of them, OK? Um, just like there's certain things that a guy will never tell a woman. They'll only tell another guy. Um, and, and it's usually those personal embarrassing things that you have difficulty sharing with anybody. And you have to find that one person that you can feel comfortable with to talk about an issue. Um, and so I don't think there's anything wrong, and I think it's still needed because we still have a world where facing or breaking into the barriers, the ceilings that exist, we still have to work on together. But I do think you have to do it not forgetting that the bridges are important. You had your hand up. Hello. Hello. Tell me who you are. I'm Isabella. Isabella. I didn't meet you earlier, did you? Oh, you must have come in a new group. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. I was wondering, you were telling us oh, so much about uh, you were telling us so much about the influence your family had. What about the influence of your peers, especially when you were younger? I mean, or a teenager. Peers are so important. You want to fit in, and there's a lot of peer pressure. And how did you escape, for example, the bad influences in the neighborhood you grew up? It's an interesting question, because my cousin didn't. You'll read in the book that I had a cousin who was like my brother. He's probably closer. He was my soulmate when I was growing up. We did everything together. In writing this book, all of my family and I were digging up photographs. And in virtually all the family photographs, if I was in the picture, Nelson was in the picture too, because we were literally inseparable. I became a Supreme Court Justice. He became a junkie and died of AIDS at 28. So two people 
with a very similar background, different parents, but a very similar background and many similar experiences because we did everything together. We took different paths. I got the benefit of being a girl, which he didn't. And girls were more protected um, and weren't let out on the streets the way my, the males were. And so he was subjected to the temptations of the street in the way I wasn't. I mean, I couldn't walk outside alone because my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, any adult, including the males in my family, would never let a young girl walk alone in those mean streets. They were mean streets back then. And so that gave me some protection. But I think my mother had certain ways about her that helped um, give us additional protection. We were the house that everybody came to play in. And it was because my mother never cared about a mess, never cared about them eating us out of house and home, and my friends often did. Um, and then we would get tuna fish sandwiches for a week. A serious story. Um, but she fed anybody who came to the house. She let us play music as loud as we wanted. She would send my aunt, who was living with us, she never came out. She would make my aunt the bad guy. So every hour or hour and a half, my aunt would walk through to make sure we weren't doing anything bad except kissing, you know? And then she would go back and tell my mother that somebody was kissing in the corner. And my mother would fight with my aunt and tell her, oh, let them kiss, you know? Because um, it was a house full of kids. And that made it so neither my brother or I had a need to be out on the streets. And she could see what we were doing it. And she could monitor when we were stepping further away than what she wanted. One rule in the house, no drugs. But she didn't notice when there was a six pack of beer in the house. And as long as it was beer, she kept quiet. And we didn't do it openly. We would never show it to her. But she knew everything. Mothers always do. I'm not recommending that today because I think there are issues that we know about today that she didn't know about then, how bad alcohol is for kids. But you know, back then, it was a different world. Um, but I think that that, in part, accounts for a lot of why I, es I escaped. Because she gave us the freedom to be at home in a way that didn't alienate us. She became the confidant of all of my friends who had problems with their parents. They would come and spill their guts to my mother. And my mother was never judgmental. She would try to explain what the parents were doing and why. And she would never tell their secrets. And all of that kept me in a very different world than my cousins. Yes. Mike? Yeah, is a guy going to raise his hand? <laughs> oh, I'll come back to you next. Okay. <laughs> you see, I'm discriminating. I'm oh, going to no. pick him. <laughs> OK, thank you. Hi, I'm Amy uh, Parrish. It's such a pleasure Amy. to be here. And um, my question is, both general and specific, I wondered how much time you have to read for pleasure and what kinds of, of things you're doing in your free time. And then also whether you happen to have read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, no. What, no. Okay. <laughs> or, or what you think of the idea of women having to um, take that initiative themselves rather than the broader culture um, being the ones to. to Not having the, read the book, I'll start the other way, OK? Not having read the book, it's hard to comment on it. I know that her thesis, because I've read reviews of it, and, and I've actually um, have heard her speak on the radio. So I know a little bit about her thesis. I guess my life is a testament to her advice. And so I, I have always understood that um, we need two paths. We need the path of societal change, and we need the path of individual initiative. I don't think one is exclusive of the other. 
Um, her book makes it suggest that it might be, or her talk does. But I don't think she would disagree with me, ultimately. I, I do think that um, it's a joint venture. How's that? With both ideas playing a role. The first half of your question, now I've forgotten the first half. What, what do you read? Oh, what I read. Right now, I'm reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, and I've been reading it because my uh, college friend Mary, who I describe in the book, and who was the one who gave me the list of classics that I needed to read, um, routinely writes me or sends me a book that she says I have to read. And when she does, I read it. <laughs> but um, despite having it on my bedside for a month, I'm only through the first 100 pages. Reading during the uh, term of the court is, for pleasure reading is almost impossible. It's a very, very difficult enterprise because we're reading constantly, not just the briefs that parties give us, the amici brief, which are friends of the court briefs, and there's sometimes there's dozens and dozens of them. We've had cases with over 100 of those. Um, it's routine for us to get regularly cases with 80 or more amici briefs. But then we have to read the cases that we're interpreting. Um, we give speeches, and most of my, reach, my re personal reading is around topics or ideas that I have for a speech and how to develop that and, and how to think about it. And since I'm not talking about cases, that's reading that's different, but it's the same. It's legal thinking. Um, so given all of that, my pleasure reading has diminished greatly, and I rely on friends to tell me what to read. And now in May, I will send out a blast email to my closest friends and say, what should I read during the summer? And they'll get me a list and I'll have someone download it onto my iPad and I'll travel with it. Yes, sir, I said I would come back to you. Come, come forward. Hello, you are? My name is Shano. Shano, if you put the Shano. microphone down, oh, yeah, yeah. they can do that. <laughs> oh, he wants us in the light. Yeah, I need some more light. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Uh, my question would be: Listening to your life stories looks like a, like a oh, Mr. Emerson, hi. Uh, looks like a, like a, like a story, like a great story. And um, was there any time when you felt like the hardships were too much that you had to give up? And in case it happens, what kept you going? What was your secret of success? You just mentioned a little. I, no, I didn't said, read the book. I said a little bit. When but there must be a real secret that no, you. No, no, it's not a real like, secret. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it must be. You know, it's stubbornness. Um, just Vice stubbornness. Vice President Biden. Uh, in our meetings, one day told me a story about his mother. He said that the best advice that his mother had given him, the best words of wisdom, was when she said, Joe, um, the character of a person is measured not by how often they're knocked down, but by how often they get up. And I realized as soon as he said it that that was a statement about me. I never measure life by how many times I'm knocked down. Because if you do that, you get discouraged. And you give up. And yes, have there been moments where I've been close to giving up? Absolutely. All of us are human. I'm human, for God's sake. I'm not a saint, believe me. Talk to my friends. Um, but in the end, in each of those moments, it wasn't the fear of failure, because failure is what knocks you down. It was a sense of giving up and not having that life that I talked about. The life where I could put my head down and sleep well each night, because I could ask myself the question, what have I learned new, and what have I given today? And I think that, you know, you have to have a reason for living. And the only person who can create that reason is yourself. You have to find the light that keeps you going. No one, but no one can do that for you. Good luck. All right, yes. 
And I'm going to go to the other room, or you're going to come out to me if you have a question. Hi. Hi. If you put that down, you'll like the picture. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, thank you. My, my name is Shifra. Hello. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, particularly, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not even American, but it's been so inspirational. I, I am a woman and I have been, the, I have benefited from affirmative action at an elite university. Um, so I suppose my question is, um, I'm now a very junior academic, but going forward, my question is about um, giving back to my community, because it's something that I left behind, I feel like I left behind a long time ago. and something that I want to think about as I go forward in my life. What do you do to give back to the community that you left? Is it a question of succeeding as well as you can? Is it a question of personal mentorship? Is it a question of um, raising awareness? And um, what are your, your thoughts on that? It's all of that. It's finding your own individual way of doing it. You know, I can't do today what my mentor did for me, which is to take a young student and teach them how to write. Because my life is so complex that taking the time to do that is a near impossibility. But when I had more time, for example, when I was a judge, I took my own cousin who was failing an exam, a civil service exam, and he came to my office at the end of every one of my days for about two months. And I taught him how to take exams. And he passed and he got the job he wanted, okay? I had another friend who was writing a senior thesis. And her background was like mine. Her father had died when she was very young, raised by a single mother. But unlike my mother, her mother didn't have a profession. So her level of poverty was worse. And she had managed to get herself through college. And she had even managed to get a master's degree but she had never written a thesis or something that was almost book length. And I actually sat down with her for a summer, and as she wrote every chapter, I would sit down and talk it out with her. And I taught her how to ask herself, what's the purpose of this chapter? What is it that I want to accomplish? How am I going to do it? And then ask the question I ask myself every day, is there a better way of doing whatever it is I want to do? And that's what you apply to your own life. If you want to give back, you look at yourself and you think to yourself, given my time, given my talents, given my personal strengths and weaknesses, how do I use what I can use and make it valuable from where I came from? And sometimes when you can, it'll be a personal mentorship. Other times, it will be something as dirty as money, but it helps, and as quick as money, but that helps too. And sometimes, it's just simply going back to the neighborhood regularly and talking to school kids and telling them your story, which I do all the time. I go back, and that's why, in part, I wrote my book was to tell my story to help my community to see a way out and to see dif the different ways that I use to get out. Some may suit them, some may not, but to involve them in thinking creatively about how to improve their own lives. And so all of those ways require you to take some action, but to think about what could work. We never go back completely. Um, but the reality is, as much as you think you belong to this world, the world you're in, there will be always a moment that someone says something or does something that you don't understand, and you'll still feel like an outsider. You're never going to be fully a part of any world, but you can take the richness from both. You can figure out what the good was and use it to advantage. Good book. All right, you guys, anybody in there want to raise their hand? They're all, come on up. Come, come on out because they have to take your picture. Come on. Come on. Hello. Hello. Tell, I give, let's take. Okay. <laughs> tell me your name. 
Aurora. Aurora. Like I'm... my aunt, you have to read my book. <laughs> my mother's I sister. Will. <laughs> I will. I come from Spain, so I can't speak in Spanish with you, but... Uh, me da en cualquier <laughs> idioma que quiera. <laughs> I will try in, in English. You are the product of uh, the good America, the tolerant one, the open one, with lots of opportunities for people coming from minorities. I want to know how do you see now your America with yeah. this Fox television channel, with the Tea Party, <laughs> with ele uh, le legislative elections in three months' time? Is it going to change? What is going to happen to these <sighs> minorities, people who didn't have the chances you had? It's harder. Yeah. The challenges are going to be much tougher. Uh -huh. um, but I am a historian by nature and in background. And I believe that history goes in cycles. We had a cycle, a very long cycle, of slavery and uh, subjugation of people. And despite a civil war that killed many people, despite resistance to integration when it first started, we had to change, and we changed. And to the extent that we had a period where people understood that integration doesn't happen naturally, it's not merely a wish that so spontaneously occurs. It's something you have to work at. And people were more willing to work at it during the civil rights era. And you're right, today we have a very different politic. We have a very different view. Um, the challenge will be for this to survive without race wars. Um, because the reality is that if an unequal America continues, not just for minorities, but for the poor, between the poor and the rich, um, that situation will destabilize us. And that destabilization will make us poorer by nature. And so I have a great confidence in the fact that we need to do some of this going backwards to come forward again. But I have great faith in, yeah, in the American conscience. And I think ultimately um, the doors and the sense of needing to have the doors open will come again. I'm an eternal optimist, by the way. <laughs> yes, sir. Tell me your name. Steve Schindler. Hello, Steve. <laughs> None of the Ste of the Schindler family of fame. It's a different story. Ah, okay. I mean, one of the things that you said early on I found to be surprising, and I wonder if you could just expand on that a little bit. And it was the recognition, your awareness of your position in Washington, D.C., and you didn't say that you, rea you realize this awesome responsibility to kind of serve the United States. In fact, what you said was, and I think that it's so self-aware, that you saw such an important responsibility to be yourself and to protect yourself and to serve yourself. And I just wonder if you can talk a little more about Perhaps it's family where that came from, because I find that to be so strengthening. Well, you're making an assumption. And that is that in what I said, I wasn't recognizing that ego, in what I identify, is what leads people to think they have the answers. And that they have to be right because they're their answers. And so when I said what I said, it was in the context of understanding that being me was always understanding that I didn't have all the answers. The, the me that I'm talking about is the Sonia that understands that I am not God and that I'm not always right 
that I have to be open to be persuaded. I have to be open to changing my mind. One of the greatest gifts that John Paul Stevens gave me in his year that I was working with him was one day saying to me, Sonia, no one is born a justice. And that moment, a lot of pressure came off my shoulders because all of the fears I had about the things I didn't know, the things I didn't feel I was doing well, um, all of the things that I felt I needed to learn and wasn't sure that I had the time to, all of those left me because I realized it was part of the growing into being a justice that was natural. Um, so I am sorry my answer didn't really explain what I meant. Um, the Sonia I was talking about was the Sonia that I perceived to be that way. Um, and the power I was talking about was the power of people thinking they always have the right answers. And that's what I see as so dangerous. I believe yes. you have to come to an end. Yes. yes. <laughs> Everybody has to be tired right yeah. now, no? Yeah. <laughs> but let me ask a last question. And ah, she, can... she gets to ask anything she wants. <laughs> when I observed you here and uh, in the dining room, there was there arose a question. It, the question means, was it a cultural shock for some persons that you became a uh, uh, justice of the Supreme Court. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are still not happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, there's no question that many people see my appointment as hope for themselves, mm -hmm. hope that they can achieve their own dreams, hope that there is a door of opportunity still available. And I'm glad that I could do that for, for some people because I think hope is so important in life for everyone. Um, but, you know, in every court case, people forget that when judges decide cases, somebody wins and somebody loses. And the loser never feels like they've been treated fairly. Mm -hmm. um, some people may say that, but they feel that they've been injured and their rights or their injury has not been recognized. And if you keep that in mind, then as a judge, you can never think that anything you do, um, even being me, is a good thing for everybody.